So good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the webinar today. From uh, I'm a graduate engineer in Arab Hong Kong, and I am so honored to be with our two speakers. And we also have the consultant in Arab, uh, Melody. Um, so, um, building a significant use of energy and material in the society, and they have a large impact on the natural environment and resources. Um, therefore, to reduce the energy use as well as the greenhouse gas emission, it's very important to promote the sustainable building design. Therefore, in this sharing section, the representative from both Hong Kong and Malaysia will talk about the sustainable building design in their own context. And um, it will last for around 30 minutes. So um, afterward, they will be given a discussion topic um, for sharing their perspective on that topic. Um, so um, during the sharing sections, there will be polling questions um, shared by the speakers. So please be reminded to be interactive to submit your answer when the polling question pop up to your screen. So um, at the end, there will be a Q&A section. Um, so you can enter your questions in the Q&A box. And um, so you can also indicate the speakers that you particularly want to ask to, and we'll try our best to address as much questions as possible. So before I pass the time to, um, to our two speakers, I would like to have a brief introduction about the Energy Institute as well as the Young Professional Network. Um, so um, the Energy Institute, EI, is a professional organization for engineers and other professionals in the energy-related field. And we are formed in 2003 with the merge of the Institute of Petroleum as, and the Institute of, of Energy. And um, we try to offer as many chances as possible to our EI member by different uh, unique insight, networking opportunities, and different kind of development activities as well. Um, so for the Young Professional Network, YPN, we are part of the EI and we are a collective of 15 international and regional branches. Um, we aim, um, we act as the hub for tomorrow's energy leaders. And our mission is to draw together um, the cross discipline energy professionals from diverse backgrounds to learn in, about and discuss the key energy issues. And we try to engage in the topical issues across the industry and continuously expand the professional network to benefit the development and the career of our members. So talking about the generation 2050, the Gen 2050 is a new initiative formed by the EI and um, the global YPN and our partners aim to provide a platform for all the young professionals around the world um, to have a louder voice in um, the big debate about the climate change and all the energy related issues. Um, so we want our young profession to be heard. And um, so at the heart of the Gen 2050, we have launched a survey and in order to capture the fields and perspective from all around the world. So um, if you are under 35, uh, uh, if you are 35 or under, and if you're working um, or even studying uh, in energy, please uh, visit um, and stay tuned to the Gen 2050, and you um, please um, click into the survey part as well. So um, the web link will be sent to all of you as well. So please, please, please share your ideas and perspective um, for support as well. Um, so before I really pass the time to the speakers, uh, please be reminded to mute your mic and also turn off your camera to avoid any interference during the sharing sessions. And the uh, this today um, webinar will be uh, will be fifty minutes more than the expected hours. Um, so let me pass the time to our first speakers, um, Hans, to speak in terms of the Malaysian contest. 
Pam, please. Very good. Thank you, Hayden. Um, my name is uh, my name is Hans. Uh, I'm the managing director of Napoli in, in Malaysia. We're one of the larger green building consultants in, uh, in Malaysia. And basically, what I want to do with you is I want to talk for 15 or so minutes about the work that we have done, what we are trying to do, and how sustainability is positioned within Malaysia. So I want to talk about the uh, the challenges, the opportunities. And all that comes, uh, all that comes with it. So I think we can go to the uh, the next slide straight away. So before we get into this, I want to stop and ask ourselves, you know, why are green buildings constructed in the first place? You know, we talk about green buildings and say it's important, but it's important to understand who is asking for this and who is pushing for this. I think it's generally accepted that there are benefits associated with environmentally responsible buildings. And green buildings or green certification is a common and proven method of signaling superior environmental performance. And the central aim of this is to alter behavior of the market participants through the provision of improved information about the environmental impacts of their real estate decisions. And basically what I mean to say is that for occupiers, meaning the people that live in the buildings or that work in these buildings, this translates to reduced costs, meaning you have to pay less for your energy bill or your water bill, as well as a healthier and more productive environment. For investors, or the people that build these buildings, uh, it leads to better returns as a result of higher rents and lower void rates. Um, and the key expectation is, is that this pricing mechanism actually we will create pricing differentials. However, I think we, we have to put this in perspective as well, especially in 2020, um, due to COVID, the Malaysian GDP growth is expected to shrink and the demand outlook for real estates is worsening. And you will see that this will have an impact on the real estate sector, as well as the demand for green buildings. And you may argue both ways here. Uh, it may be really with soft demand needed to signal superior, superior performance, but it may not lead to increased rental yields straight away. Five to nine percent is what is typical in a normal market, and it may be slightly less in these things. But in short, um, there are both push and pull factors for green buildings. Can we go to the next slide? The next slide, the text is very, very small, but uh, have a look at the uh, have a look at the graph. I think when we look next at the trends, we see that green building certification in Malaysia is going through the typical industry cycles. And I think this may be the case for other countries as well. Ten years ago, green building certification was all about innovation, about creativity, first movers. This is when this was introduced. After that became a, a segment of growth where standards were set, technology was introduced, fast followers came along, and today we are in the maturity phase, or maybe even in the late maturity phase, meaning that the industry and the participants become more aware, it is more demand driven and also more cost driven. And I think this is, is important to, to understand. And what you see next, and I think this is very crucial, is that there is a slight decline and another line that is coming there. I think what is happening next will be a next uptick or a next cycle that will start. Um, if we can predict what that cycle will be, this would be very, very good for, for all the people involved. This is always hard to see, but uh, quite likely, um, this might be about health and well-being. This is something that we see today already, where there is an increased focus in uh, towards the building occupants and how buildings are impacting health and well-being. If we have the right foresight, we can become the leaders in the in these buildings. Um, let's go to slide number three. When we look at Malaysia specifically. Um, there are several tools that are used for green building certifications. And I think the, the three tools I've highlighted here are the most prevalent. You have GBI or the Green Building Index, Green RE, and uh, LEED. Um, together, they take the vast majority of the market. There are a slight, there's a, a few 
tier orders that, that participate as well. All of those rating tools are based on common denominators. Basically, what I'm trying to say is they're all based on water efficiency, location, transportation, energy, material, and indoor environmental quality. What's the difference between them? It is slightly how they weigh the different categories and the different, the different points. Uh, all of them are rigorous, all of them are tested, and all of them are valuable. Uh, the GBI, or Green Building Index, is the one that started in Malaysia and has the best market awareness. Uh, Greenery is slightly more flexible and uh, gaining popularity. And LEED, I guess, is the international uh, standard, especially relevant for clients that want to have, want to signal towards international clients their uh, commitment to sustainability. Can we go to the next slide? Here, this is specifically about Malaysia. And I think Malaysia's environment is in a fix. You've got ancient jungles, teeming seas and varied tropical landscapes. And together it makes the 12th most biodiverse country in the world. Um, but at the same time, the nation's economy has grown rapidly and it has destructed many of these ecosystems. Much of this has happened before terms like conservation and sustainability are even defined. And old habits um, you know, are, are, are hard to, to get rid of. Furthermore, what you see is that uh, Malaysia's population has exploded in the last few decades, tripling since 1970 from 10 million to 30 million now. And it's one of the most urbanized countries in East Asia. And their consumptive demands actually put stress on the environment. Um, and as the economy continues to mature and more and more population goes to these metropolitan centers, you will see that the environment is suffering from this. And in the recent years, a disposable culture has evolved. Uh, Malaysians now produce 30,000 tons of waste every day, and only 5% of this is recycled. And when you live here, you are aware that landfill landfills are overflowing. Uh, and garbage is sometimes dumped right into the rivers or just over the hill over the hillsides. This disposable culture also links back to water. Uh, there is a concept that natural resources are plentiful and nobody can make a difference. And this you know, makes it makes it hard uh, for us to change behaviors. But this is exactly my next point. When we talk about changing behaviors, it is difficult but not impossible. I want to ask you, next slide please, uh, a, a, a short poll question. This poll question is based on the research, uh, you can go to the next slide, uh, it's based on the research that has been done by uh, medical, by Harvard Medical School, and, and pay attention. This is about doctors asking patients that have just undergone a serious heart operation, and the doctor tells you, you must change your lifestyle, otherwise you will die. You know, simply as that. Which percentage of the people do you think, this is my question to you, right, will revert back to the behavior that got them into trouble in the first place? So take a little bit of time to, to answer. I'll continue, I'll continue while you, whilst you answer this. Um, so what kind of behaviors that the doctor said? Simply things as eat healthy, exercise, don't smoke, the usual, the usual things. So again, right, people with a serious heart operation just have undergone it. And what is their, you know, how many of these people got back into trouble and basically falling back to the behavior in the first place? Let's see if we can see the, uh, if we can see the results. Maybe I need to click something myself too. Let's see. We'll, we'll come back to, I'll give you the answer now. I don't see the answer on my screen. I'll, I'll share with you the results in a, in a little bit. But basically 90% of the people reverted back to the question or the behavior that got them into trouble in the first place. And I wanna you know, stop here and, 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 and ask, you, ask you this. 
how is it possible that 90% of the people basically get back into trouble, even after a life-threatening disease? And can you imagine what that means for sustainability when we ask people, could you please be more efficient with water? Could you please save energy? How likely is it that people will do it? I've got the results here. Most people will say 10%, you know, 20% says 10% will go back to it. And a majority of the people basically saying 21%, uh, 60% of the people refer it back. So we got already an idea of, of how difficult it is. And I want to change this back to sustainability and the behavior that is needed. But how about that remaining 10%, that 10% that did change, right? I'm, I'm telling you this is a proper research. Here, the doctor told them this. The doctor said, guys, you just had a serious heart authorization. You're not God. I'm not God. I can't promise you you live forever. However, if you want to maintain and live your life happily and healthy, and you want to walk in the park together with your spouse without any pain, you need to you know, change the, your behavior. You need to change your, your, your lifestyle choices. There are, if you pay attention, I hope you can, you can sense this, there are small changes in this. This message is personal, emotional, and positive. Only when things are personal, emotional, and positive, we are getting to uh, change. Next slide, please. And this, this gets me to my, my final slide and my final point. In terms of sustainability, many places, including Malaysia, requires change, change in attitude, change in behavior. And therefore, the future, in my view, must hold the following. We need to increase the awareness. And we need to simplify the process of certification towards green buildings. But most importantly, we have to communicate positively and with emotion and make things personal, otherwise people will not change. Incentives can also play a part of this, but this personal, uh, positive and emotional is absolutely crucial to this. And when we try, we can see that there is a change to be, change to be held. Uh, and I want to leave it on, on this message that uh, with the right effort and with the right tactics, we can create change, but it's certainly something that we need to think about. Thank you very much. So thank you so much for hand sharing on his perspective in terms of the Malaysian contest. So I would like to pass the time to Melody to speak in terms of the Hong Kong contest. Melody, please. Thanks, Hayton. Thanks, Hans, for introducing the mechanism of green building certification and also let us know more about the Malaysia contest. And I'm Melody uh, from Aru. I'm a consultant for green building and sustainable building design. Um, before I go into the detail, let's have a poll question first. Uh, what do you think is the most tricky reason for having a green building? A, market trend. B, benefits of having a green building. C, client requests. D, regulatory requirements. E, environmental and social responsibility, or F, company policy. Um, while you are answering the polling, and let's move on to talk about uh, Hong Kong situation. Next slide, please. Yes. Um, Hong Kong currently, most, most of the project are actually using the Hong Kong Green Plus, that is the building environmental assessment method. It is a tailor made for the high rise, high density built environments of the subtropical climate in Hong Kong. It embraces a range of good practices in planning, design, construction, management, operation, and maintenance of the building. It's actually aligned with our local code regulation and standards and it's a voluntary green building label scheme. And at the same time, actually project will also go for LEED certification, but not as much as Green Plus. It is because Hong Kong government is trying to play a very important role in pushing a sustainable building design. Um, it took a very first step in 2009 because they published a strong circular letter to put, uh, push their governmental building they have to, must to 
uh, go for the second highest rating in Green Quest certification. And after the government taking the very first step, they tried to look into the private market and they tried to like, have some sorts of incentive for private markets to go for the Green Quest certification. And that's why they have the gross four area transaction since April 2011. And for people, for projects that go for Bean Quest, they could get the GFA concession as an incentive. And then with the global trend that sustainable building design or building stand, sustainable building standard get to more and more mature, and people start to aware about well-being in healthcare, especially nowadays because of the COVID-19, and more people will go for the well certification in Hong Kong. And, but I could say most of the project nowadays who go for well certification are those well known developers because the certification fee is comparatively pricey than the others. And for the others, like some kind, some of the project will go for the China Green Building Label, Green uh, Fitwell, these kind of uh, certification. And apart from the government incentive, let's see if we could got some of the result from the polling. Next slide, please. Yeah, I think it's quite interesting to look into the reason why people will go for the green building certification. And as I can see, the polling suggested that because it's uh, go for certification. It's exactly that comes up before uh, green building certification. And in 2016 to 17, Hong Kong Green Building Council is trying to conduct a survey about uh, green building standards to ask 44 commercial companies and non governmental organizations that have participated in green building projects to provide some kind of feedback or comments about green building. And the result revealed that actually 32% because of the client request. And then follow up by 23% because of the regulatory requirement and for and the environmental and social responsibility and 4% are because of the company policy. And it's more or less the same as the polling question now we got because most of people reply that because of the regulatory requirement and also the environmental and social policy. And as you can see, we just have few, very few reply because of the market trend or the benefits of having a green building. As a designer or as a project team, actually we are at a very passive position. We are always told to do, to have green building, but not our incentive or, or we initiate to have green building for our project. And after understanding um, more about um, more about the market response or how we see our green building and let's understand more about the Hong Kong content. And before that, I would like to have a poll question. Um, what are the hurdles uh, of having the green building to you? A, high capital costs, B, lack of governmental incentive, B, low public awareness, B, low market demand, or E, lack of green building professionals? And you can uh, take your time to answer the polling question and let's move on to the next slide to talk about, to know more about the challenges of having a green building or having a green building design in Hong Kong. To know more about the Hong Kong context, next slide, please. Um, I could say it's more or less, not more or less, similar to Malaysia context because uh, we have very limited land. 40% of the Hong Kong land is actually reserved for the country parks or the mountains. We have so many people, we have 7.4 million people living in this God's land in Hong Kong. And because we have so many people and we have limited land, we are very packed together and building a building, building are very close to each other. And in order to fully utilize the land, actually we have to go upwards in a vertical direction. And we have very tall and very high building. And that's why, as you can see in the middle of the pictures, the buildings, the buildings are very packed together and very tall. As a result, we have the issue like wall buildings because it will trap the air pollutants, it affects the wind environments of the neighborhoods. 
and also it affects our daylight access. And at the same time, because we have so limited land, parts of the residential building have to build near the highways, and therefore they suffer from noise issue. And at the same time, we're also facing the waste problem because um, nowadays we're currently using landfill as the major way of our waste management strategy. And that's why we have so many people generating most of the waste every day. And the only way we could deal with is to dump to the landfill. And we face a very critical waste management issue nowadays. And last but not least, it's seldom talked about in Hong Kong because we have very little incentive to do about waste ma uh, water management because the incentive of using water is so, so, so little because the pricing or charging of water is very cheap in Hong Kong. We have no any incentive to save the water. And then let's look into the polling question again. Um, next slide, please. I think the answer is much more the same to the survey conducted before. Most of people replied that because of the high capital cost, and that's why they think that it's the hurdle for, they, for them to have the green building. And 57% of people think that because of the high capital cost, and followed up by the 25% are because of the lack of governmental incentive. For this part, I group these two figures, high capital cost and lack of government incentive into one, uh, major factor uh, because of the financial consideration. But the interesting point I would like to point out here is the survey they, they considered before. They not just asked about the first or the major challenges, they will also ask for the second challenges and the third challenges. And for the low public awareness and the low market demand for green building, uh, both score few in the greatest challenges, but they score the lar largest percentage when it comes to the second and the third greatest challenges. That means, apart from financial consideration, actually most people think that no public awareness and no market demand are also the major consideration or the major hurdle when they are trying to go for green building. And for the high capital cost and lack of governmental incentive, I could say this kind of financial problem is inherent because it seldom eliminated, uh, but it could be addressed by several ways, like by uh, advanced technology development with more government incentive. Uh, it could be solved um, more like technically or tangibly, but for the other way, like low public awareness or market demand, it may require us more effort. And the key point I would like to deliver here is that somehow we cannot just look into the things in a very surface way. Just like we cannot, when we have the green building, we just, we cannot just think about the capital cost because we need to change our mindset to look into a picture or look into a building in a more holistic approach. Because when you have a building, we just we are not just considering the construction time. We are also considering about the operation time. But looking into the life cycle costing or the life cycle of building, when you pay higher at the very beginning because of the high capital cost, actually those high energy efficiency equipment could pay you back for the high capital cost at the very beginning because it would save your electricity bill while operating. And at the same time, financial benefits that have mentioned by hands before because you have green building certification and that's why you could sell a higher price and high rental price. These are actually the financial benefits that could like maybe cover your high capital cost at the very beginning. And at the same time, those intangible benefits like the higher productivity environment and the marketing effect of having the green building actually can pay you back. And somehow we could we need to change our mindset to look into or while we are considering for a green building. And next slide, please. And other than the hurdles, I could say there are still some gaps for green building, especially in Hong Kong. Uh, as I mentioned in 2011, we have the uh, government incentive of GFA concession for people who go for green press certification. Yet there is the doubling the number uh, of sustainable building in 2000, from 2011. But as you can see, the figures suggested here, more than 30% of the project 
rates are actually only unclassified rating. That means it's just the minimum requirement to get the GFA concession. Some people may regard this as a loophole for the clients who just pay the minimum effort to get the same return for those projects who pursue for the highest rating. And government incentive is somehow asking or pushing people to go for the certification, but not to go beyond. Or I could say it's not truly sustainable building. And that's why government or the market has to address these gaps. And at the same time, not just about um, just meeting the minimum requirement. So actually the incentive is just focusing on the new building part. When we look into the existing buildings, actually like in Hong Kong private sector, we had 47 thousands of buildings. But for the project who go for being existing building certification, it's just less than 0.3% in the recent four years. That means it's just like few hundreds of the buildings in Hong Kong will go for the existing building certification. There is actually no any incentive for existing building or interior to go for the sustainable building certification. Next slide. And as I mentioned before, the gaps and also the man, uh, the hurdles, like the cost, awareness, and the demand, actually all three parties, the clients, public, and the government has to work together. Uh, because Hans has mentioned more on the emotional, personal, and positive uh, consideration while we are thinking about um, sustainable building design. And let's talk more about like the policy or the uh, market response towards sustainable building development. Um, in Hong Kong, we are facing, I could say, a bottleneck situation because, as I mentioned, people just go for the certification, but not to go beyond or really truly um, review the sustainable building design in their project. And the situation could only be improved uh, when all the market individuals and the government working together. For example, like the public and the government should work together to create the incentive for having the green buildings. Like us, Individually, we could use our consumer choice. When we buy a house, buy a flat, or rent a house, we could choose building that with uh, sustainable building certification. And for the client and the governments, when they try to build their project, they have to think about uh, the benefits of having the green buildings and try to realize it and tell the public about the benefits of having the green building, like the high productivity environment, better air quality, these kind of issues. And for the public and the clients, they have to have their mindset changes to appreciate the benefits of having the green buildings. And by all these three parties and working together, and I think we could set more of tackle the problems or the hurdles or the gaps of having sustainable buildings in Hong Kong nowadays. And next slide, please. And last but not least, um, before uh, any, uh, before I would like to having some like take home message to all of you, let's talk about the trend of having sustainable buildings in Hong Kong or in global context. Uh, as of in the past, we just look into the new building, uh, more on energy, water or material resources. And then we extend our, um, uh, ex we extend it to neighborhood, uh, existing building and interior. And then we now focusing more on health and well-being because of the COVID-19. And at the same time, because we are loads with the big data, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these kind of like fancy work. And actually the digital or smart building can help us to push the sustainable development of buildings forward. And eventually, I think the destination should be achieving the net zero carbon uh, building. Uh, this is also the concept proposed by World, Breathing, World Green Building Councils that the campaign to promote and support the drive towards achieving 100% net zero carbon buildings by 2015. And just like the news last week, actually China is, is also committed to carbon neutrality in, by 2015. Net zero carbon is actually the trend. And before we go for the trend, we need to somehow uh, my mindset should be shift uh, for individuals and also the organizations. From the past, we just looked into the profits. Now we should look more on the purpose. And from the 
past, we just always rely on the top-down approach by controlling. Nowadays, we need to shift to more on the empowering. And that's all for my sharing today. Um, so thank you so much, Melody, for the great sharing. Um, so I'll show you pass the time to our, dis to our discussion section. So, um, how green building are more future proof as compared to conventional buildings nowadays. So in the Malaysia context, we can see like more and more tall buildings are constructed in Malaysia right now. So are they actually like green buildings? So in the Hong Kong context, we can see there are a lot of like skyscrapers and a lot of numbers of buildings. So uh, how those buildings are green and maybe like stay sustainable? Um, so maybe Han first. Thank you, Hayden. Um, I think it's a very interesting question and a good question to ask, you know, how sustainable are our current buildings and are green buildings indeed sustainable? Um, there's many many ways of answering this question. I, I think I'd like to answer it in a, in a particular way, but I think it's interesting. Uh, first of all, I think in the past, people got away with uh, building or constructing buildings that were not sustainable. And the reason for this is that they were focused on short-term budgets. They were basically relying that uh, clients were not fully aware of the benefits. And they basically just kept the cost low and increased their profits by doing so. However, that is not a sustainable practice. Uh, buildings are there for the next 30, 40, 50 years. And I think as a developer, you cannot rely on this concept of hoping that your tenants or the, your, your occupants of the building will not realize that actually a green building is not only cheaper to live in, more productive to work in, but also more healthier. This sooner or later will be common knowledge and maybe it takes two years, maybe it takes five years, maybe it takes 10 years. But if you build a, a building today that is not sustainable or not green, I think in the near future, you will realize that nobody would like to work or live in these buildings and you are jeopardizing short term financial gains for the long term. Um, more and more buildings are getting green. It's a matter of awareness, pull and push factors. We still got a, a long way to go. But if you really think it through, in the long term, there's only one way to go. And that means sustainable, healthy, and, you know, a, a buildings that are equally good for your know, productivity and for, and for your wallet. Um, I like to see more of these buildings being green, uh, but at least it's going in the in the right direction. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Hans. So, uh, Melody, please. Yeah, for the question about how green building are more future proof as compared to conventional building, I could say um, somehow future proof means uh, mesh with the concept of sustainability because we cannot sacrifice the future needs and that's why we have to think about for our future generation. And for green building, because obviously nowadays we need to uh, address the energy usage, water usage and material resources. And these somehow take into the consideration of the future part. And I could say it could achieve the claim of future proof, but not to a very, uh, but not or, uh, because uh, just like what I mentioned, we just think about the resources usage for green building certification nowadays. Um, actually, for the future proof means like um, the short life parts of the building can actually be extended for their lifespan. But for most of the building nowadays, um, I could say, especially in Hong Kong, we just consider about having the building for um, to be able to be there like 100 times, 100 years time. Um, we just make sure that it is safe and to achieve some kind of screen building certification. But for the future needs or uh, for the future trends, we seldom think about it. Just like, for example, like uh, 
if you want to have a future office, uh, what would you build for that kind of project? But actually for the future trend, it may not have any office anymore because people like nowadays, we always work at home and we have to think about the future needs. And that's why we have to think about how to build our office. Just say, it's a, just an example of showing that somehow for the future proof means that not just sustainable, but we have to also consider about the future trends. And for um, sustainability, of course, the green building nowadays, the certification has to go more beyond because like in BIM Plus or in LEED, we just consider about the resources usage, but we have also the thing that the market, we also addressing the other requests or response, like we need to care about our occupancy, spending so much time indoor, and we concern about the health and well-being, and that's why we have well certification. Maybe in the future, we also have like smart building certification or all these kind of like uh, guidelines or the trends that we need to adopt it for not just sustainable or not just green building to make it as a future proof. And that's all for my share. Oh, okay, thanks so much. And that's all for discussion session. So um, let us go to the Q&A session. So uh, we received quite a few uh, questions to both Hans and Melody. So for Hans, um, does the green building have a high efficiency and maybe like, let's say antiviral safeguard? Uh, Hen, uh, you have to mute for, uh, unmute first. Very good. <laughs> Thank you for uh, highlighting this. Uh, good question. I think, you know, the first part of this, does a, a green building have a higher energy efficiency? Uh, the short answer is yes. Um, we, when we unravel the green certification system, we all realize that energy efficiency is one of the key components. Uh, and all green buildings have good to very good energy performance. Uh, when you ask me what are the percentages that can be reduced, I think 10, 15% on the lower end and sometimes 50 to 60% on the higher end. So for sure, uh, energy efficiency is there. Now, the second part of the question, how about the antiviral part? Uh, again, two parts of this. We already most, energy efficient buildings look at indoor environmental quality. They look at the quality of the air that you are breathing into. Before COVID, there wasn't necessarily a deep focus on antiviral or antibacterial parts. Uh, LEED, uh, I know this for sure, has already introduced further credits and innovations to encourage building owners to put these things in place so in the future yes for sure uh today i think yes by the rate of you know air air flows and all of those type of things there but not necessarily on antiviral but it could certainly be a component that we will see in the future okay thank you um so the second question is for melody so can green building partially or fully produce their own energy for use um, if they are constructed by the glass structures? Melody, please. Yeah, of course. Um, just like uh, the solar panel, we usually call it BIPV, the building integrated with photovoltaic panels. It's actually that you could use uh, it as your glass structure. I could say in Hong Kong, it's, um, it's considered as a less feasible solution because um, as I have mentioned before, everything's a building very tall and very packed together in order to like more efficiently use the solar resources, like these kind of BIPV, you need to have a good uh, sunlight, um, sunlight for the building. And but because we are usually very packed together, we have limited um, sunlight. And because of the shading effects of the surrounding buildings, it actually affects the efficiency or the performance of the fuel panels. And at the same time, not just about the panels, 
some people may think about having the wind turbines on their on top of their buildings. And actually, I could say we also have some issue because uh, having the wind uh, wind turbine on top of very tall building actually uh, the wind turbine may be broken by the wind because it, when it's very tall, especially in Hong Kong context, um, the high winds will actually bad for the wind turbine. And then uh, there are lots of design issue or design consideration when we want to employ uh, these kind of solar panels or wind turbines for Hong Kong context. But for the other area, like because we have a project in uh, Malina or also Philippines, when they build uh, maybe a petrol, um, natural station, they could have a very large area of having a rooftop area of having the uh, PV panels or wind turbines because they are compar uh, comparatively uh, shorter and also they have uh, less effect on the surrounding buildings and that's why they could fully utilize the sunlight and also the wind for their natural um, usage of their natural resources. And for Hong Kong context, I could say when we try to do this kind of design, we need to be very careful because we may spend a lot of money from a client to buy these equipment, but eventually, actually, the energy generation could not pay you back for the capital cost. Okay, thank you so much, Melody. Um, so we have another question to Han. So for lead, we have the Green Associate. GA, so what actually GA do and is their certificate useful? Can please. Unmute first. Um, good question again. I think starting with the second, yes, it's certainly useful. And I would highly recommend anybody who works in sustainability or is interested in sustainability to take this. Uh, for two reasons. One, it signals your commitment towards understanding the global reference standard in sustainability. There are two levels of accreditation, green associate and accredited professional. For LEED and for sustainability, it's a holistic approach covering water, energy, land, and all of these things are connected. It is proven that if you have people with the right accreditation as part of the team, the process is smoother, easier, better, and cheaper. There's tremendous value in this. Getting your green certification or a green associate certification is certainly valuable. So what is it, is it that they do? In a way, you are a green consultant. You will work with clients, you work with stakeholders, you solve their problems and you help identify the opportunities and the challenges to get buildings as certified you know at the at the right category or the, the targeted uh, categorization what's the difference between lead ga and lead ap the difference is uh, basically one extra exam and a little bit more tougher questions but to start i highly recommend people to take the lead ga exam as it will kickstart your career and it demonstrates your understanding of sustainability and adds value to the projects. Okay, thank you, Hans. Um, so talking about the green building and about the construction materials, so for Melody, um, do you think the construction material used in the green building are eco-friendly and environmentally friendly? Thank you. Mm, I could say most of the project, when they try to be more sustainable, they will try to use the materials that are eco-friendly or environmental friendly. Um, of course, uh, you have to trade off because usually these kind of products will be costly comparatively. And that's why um, I could say uh, for most of the projects in Hong Kong, because uh, the cost consideration, not every single detail of the materials will be very eco-friendly or environmental friendly. But for most of our projects, we will persuade our clients and also the contractor to try to use the materials that are comparatively more eco-friendly or environmental friendly when we get the choice. Like for example, if two kind of products, 
one with the environmental product declaration, the other happens we will persuade the client to go for the one with the EPD, environmental product declaration. Um, somehow, currently, there are not many cho material choices, I could say, because just like LEED certification proposed in version four, um, a US government or US, US GBD trying to push the market to address the material issues in order to push the market to pay more efforts on their like to become more eco-friendly or environmental friendly or have more disclosure on their material content on ingredients um yeah the market pays a lot of effort but in the currency the fact that um there are not as many choices as we could think about it um but if we got the choice actually we could persuade our clients to go for that and not just about the disclosure on the material ingredient and we also care about the recycled content whether the product is uh, purchased from regionally uh, not too far away in order to save our carbon footprint and also for the timber products we also uh, want to choose the material that is choose the timber from sustainable sources and also for the paints on um, furniture we also try to persuade the clients to go for with low VOC content less impact on the human health these kind of material uh, for green building certification actually also address it on it but in the markets I also, I also want to like persuade the market to try to put more effort on uh, having the materials that are more eco-friendly so that we could have more choices for our clients to choose and obviously as a consultant we will definitely help any like eco-friendly or environmental friendly products uh, to introduce to our, our clients to help them to have more choices so thank you melody and now we have another questions to hand so as compared from the green building and the conventional building, does the green building usually have a longer lifespan um, than the conventional one? So uh, can the green building be deconstructed instead of demolished and can that material be reused as well? Thank you. Thank you. Um, that's actually a very interesting question and there's a uh... Most of the debate actually seems to be about how to reduce materials, how to make sure that the resources consumed are you know, minimized, you know, regional materials, recycled content, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But when we take one more step back, we come to realize that actually what is part of this. If we increase the lifespan of buildings, we directly impact the material consumption and the waste consumption or the waste that is created by this. Well, to answer your question, does a sustainable build, building, you know, have a longer lifespan? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I can give an answer on this. I don't see why, and I don't see why not. I think you know, all of them are built to certain quality standards and therefore will have a, a certain lifespan that is attached to this. However, the second part is, is very interesting to say, you know, wouldn't it be better if buildings could be deconstructed or wouldn't it be greener instead of and using their materials to be reused? And I think this is actually right. Uh, there is a saying, I think you might have heard it before, the greenest building that exists is the one that has never been built, right? Um, when we look at energy consumption for these these things today there is a trend towards this we are more proactively looking at ways to reuse materials it's already encouraged in the rating systems it is promoted uh, we should do it but the reason why it is not very common yet is because it is somewhat complex it adds layers of logistical you know steps in there and as a result, people take often the easy way. However, I think this is the thought is absolutely right. A building that is deconstructed and materials that are reused will be in terms of embodied carbon and in terms of material reuse, 
much more sustainable and much more green. And I think this is the way to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so for Melody, like you mentioned before about the higher capital cost is one of the reasons of um, hurdling the green building. So um, here is the question. What is the cost of the constructing green buildings as compared to the conventional building? Melody, please. <laughs> It's a very difficult question because I cannot say a very like solid number. Um, some people would say, or some research has conducted before being placed in Hong Kong when they try to having um, the highest rating compared to uh, a project that is achieving achieving nothing, and it's around like six percent increase in in their capitals, but. Um, this is not the key point I would like to share here, because I would like to share one of my personal experience when I'm talking to a contractor, because um, when, it, when the contractor trying to like um, bid for a tender, and at that time, I usually ask, my, ask them like, oh, what is the price when you consider a project when they achieve the platinum rating, the highest rating in being uh, compared to the usual one? Like it's just like a few months uh, before a sort conversation with the contractor. And the contractor, interesting the answer is that we didn't consider anything for the additional cost for the platinum rating because we get used to it. It's, it's actually the trend or um, most of the projects they, bid, they are going for bidding now, they will go for the certification. And that's why actually there is no much, no, no big deal to them. And um, this is interesting because actually once you get more and more used to it and people just don't aware about the high capital cost compared to the very past in the very beginning, like in 2011, um, there may be cost increase at the very beginning. If from starting from zero to a sudden jump to have a green building certification. But nowadays when we get more and more used to it, to have green buildings and actually the capital costs meaning nothing to them because it's just they get used to it and and I think this is somehow the market trend and for most of the uh, contractors and also the clients should hold these kind of mindsets actually uh, it's a trend to have it and because um, we get used to it and somehow we didn't take really like care much about the higher capital costs and especially for a very large scale project or for projects that have large a large sum or large uh, large uh, because it's a large or profit sum and actually the green building certification cost is just minimal to them. Okay, thank you, Melody. Um, so we have another question. So um, actually, we cover a lot about the um, comparison between the conventional building and the green building. So like uh, for the existing conventional building, hence, do you think is it possible to convert, convert um, the conventional one into the green building one? The answer is yes, always. It is always possible. The, match, the question is just at what price or what effort. Um, but what we see more and more and more is people recognizing the benefits of green building. You know, better for your wallet, better to work in, more productive and more healthy. And most of the times, these things can be achieved with relatively straightforward changes. And there are points in the building's lifetime where things are, you know, up for maintenance or renewal or repair. These are perfect times to reassess uh, those elements and make sure your building is, is green. Um, we have quite a lot of projects that we are working on that basically convert existing buildings into new green buildings. Uh, very, very much possible. Also, even the case where I want to highlight this because it's not necessarily obvious or at least not necessarily to outsiders. Even if you are in an existing building as an office or something like that, even as a home, but let's say that you are a business, you can, and this building is not green certified you can still make your office green certified and you can use lead interior designs for this 
to still uh, signal your commitment and do your part for sustainability. So in short, yes, regardless of whether you have an existing building that you want to convert or you are, are in a building that is not, you can still do your part and convert your traditional or conventional building into a green building or office. Okay, thank you. So we will now have our final questions. And um, so how will the smart building and green building support um, the code and of the smart city in the future? Melody, please. I think smart buildings actually part of the smart cities, right? And and that's why um, I definitely see the smart building will contribute and support the goal of having the smart cities of the future. But for a smart cities, they actually um, more have to consider like the smart infrastructure, um, transport, or the other system like healthcare. These kind of also the hot topics under smart cities. And buildings is just part of it. And especially, I should say smart buildings to actually help um, people to achieve sustainable building design and also for the green buildings. Just like the version 4.1 OMM, actually it's go for more smart tech, using smart tech, the art system for the certification. It's actually going, um, to a more technical, um, a smart way to do this certification, I should say. So I think um, definitely the smart buildings and also the green buildings to support to the goal of smart city in the future. Okay, thanks so much. So um, that's the end of the Q&A section. So thank you so much, all of you guys, uh, for participating for today's e event. And we um, let's give a big applause <laughs> to uh, both our speakers, Melody and Hans. Yeah. And then um, last but not least, I want to thank you for our sponsorship partner as well, who is the Repsol Sinopec, the Orsted, the Neptune Energy, as well as the IBM. So for all the recording and the presentation pack of the today webinar will be sent to all of you guys um, after this event. So thanks again to all of you and our speakers. Um, so please stay tuned for, uh, for our future's event as well. Thank you.